uh, um, Andy Green, Wing Commander and um, Land Speed Record Holder. Um, first question, how soon after the record set in 1997 with the Thrust SSC did the idea of um, hitting a thousand miles an hour come about, would you say? Post-1997 we set the world's first and still only supersonic record. Here we are 18 years later with now the longest standing record in history. At that stage I had no expectation of getting involved in another record, um, let alone um, not just going slightly faster, but going to the limit of modern technology, to a thousand miles an hour, faster than any jet fighter has been at ground level. Mm. So, the, you know, that, it, was, it was almost a surprise that that came along. And it happened in two parts. First of all, um, there was uh, somebody else was talking about doing a UK-based record, commissioned a little bit of work to find out what was possible with some of uh, the Thrust SSC core team. They did a design study and reckoned that with developing technology it would soon be possible to get to a thousand miles an hour, yeah. probably not faster. And having come to that conclusion, that project went dead. I lost interest in it, uh, no, uh, no, no further progress. We then finished up, Richard Noble and I, uh, Richard's the project director and uh, me as the driver, we had a dinner uh, at, back uh, almost ten years ago now, um, where a government minister stood up and said, the biggest problem that not just my uh, organisation, the defence and defence industry, but actually UK industry, the biggest problem it had for the next ten years is attracting enough young people into the science and technology disciplines. Because we need, right now, in our developing uh, high technology, low carbon, energy efficient world of the future, we need to train 60,000 plus high skills engineers every year. We are currently training just over half that number. There is a big shortfall and the gap is getting bigger every year. The engineering institutions are talking about that, big engineering companies are saying it's getting harder and harder to find the, uh, the engineering skills. And it's not just this country, we can't even buy it in from, uh, from outside. Uh, there was a huge global study uh, recently run by UNESCO and the, uh, the global study of engineering said the biggest challenge for you know, the, not only the uh, first world but the developing world is a lack of science and technology expertise and the biggest root cause of this is a lack of young people getting into science and technology. So with that as a background, government minister ten years ago, nine years ago said the biggest you know, the, 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 the challenge is getting a ten-year-old at school excited about science and technology. There used to be supersonic airplanes, Concorde, flying out of Heathrow twice a day. And we used to have, you know, back in the 1960s, America was getting ready to send a man to the moon. And then Britain was developing aircraft that could land vertically, the Harrier. And all these other amazing bits of technology. So where are the iconic bits of the inspiring bits of engineering of today? And Richard and I sat in the audience and thought, well, that design study that somebody had of you know new land speed record car pushed back the boundaries we could do that so we went to I actually abused my position I was working in the Ministry of Defence which book, booked to go and see the Minister yeah. very naughty but we got away with it I said well Minister we can build you this inspiring bit of technology you know it, here's the basic outline of you lend us a military jet engine a bit of a cheeky ask but you lend us a military jet engine we can build a car that will do 1,000 um, we hoped that it was possible to do a thousand miles an hour. We were pretty confident we could do something remarkable. Mm. He said no to the jet engine and actually said, I'm not interested in a, in a really fast car. How do I get the inspirational education program? How do I reach a 10 year old at school and make them excited about science and technology? Which immediately, and that discussion in his office that day, rapidly turned around to, okay, we won't just build a car, we'll build an education program to share it with not only a UK national audience, but if it's web-based, it'll be a global audience, so everybody will benefit. And they'll get to see this amazing British-based technology, so there's another uh, UK benefit. As it was, we did manage to get our jet engine because the Typhoon test program was just coming to an end. So the Rolls-Royce EJ200 from the Eurofighter Typhoon, we managed to get hold of one of the original prototypes. World's best military jet engine out there right now. Unbelievably, with unprecedented reliability, power output, fantastic. Combine that with the next generation of uh, hybrid uh, space rocket technology, put it into a package which is using the cutting edge of motorsport and Formula One technology, carbon fiber, composite cockpit, etc., and you finish up with a state of the art motorsport, aerospace, space technology aeroplane. Uh, 
technology based in a car which will go faster than, than any car or jet fighter has ever been at ground level and has a chance to inspire a new generation. So 10 years ago, the idea of using a thousand miles an hour to build a remarkable vehicle to inspire a generation is pretty much where Blood Hound started. Um, in terms of, like, I, I presume you've uh, uh, done many tests beforehand and uh, have, um, uh, had the, I've seen the model of the, of the show and uh, seen the sculpture and the uh, seating arrangements doesn't look uh, too, uh, well, not comfortable for a daily car obviously, but uh, what, what's it like in, in terms of uh, of vision and when you're in the actual cockpit of one, one of these land speed uh, record cars? Well, it, Bloodhound, we've actually got a massive advantage. We're being a lot more sophisticated with the cockpit design than we did with, uh, yeah. with Thrust SSC, which is a little bit of, let's look at what other people have done, let's look at a couple, you know, we'll choose something that looks about right. Um, we've actually taken a much more scientific approach to this car. We are pushing back the boundaries of technology and we need the best available technology and the science behind it wherever we can get it. So we're working with the FIA Institute and their expertise. You know, these are the guys who write the rules for global motorsport, Formula One, World Rally Championship, all the other disciplines. The racing cars here at uh, the Castle event at Wilton, Wilton, they are built to FIA rules written by the people we're working with. They are already working on the next generation of technology and we are using that next generation research. Because of course, we aren't like any of those other cars. We haven't got a rule book we're actually, we can use the next generation stuff that hasn't even been written down yet. Mm. So, you know, the next generation uh, uh, harness, seat design, uh, uh, helmet, uh, air supply, every other piece of the car, and, with, and it's a bespoke design inside the, uh, the, the carbon fibre monocoque specifically to protect me in the unique environment of Bloodhound SSC. Mm. So I've got a cockpit which is designed around me, puts all the displays, and I've spent five, six years designing each bit of the uh, the instrumentation, the display, all the various controls, the emergency backup levers down on the side panels, it looks like a jet fighter cockpit. But I am a jet fighter pilot. You know, I'm uniquely lucky to have the background of the world's best day job as a Royal Air Force fighter pilot. I can bring those skills, been trained by the best in the world. I can bring those skills to a land speed record. Use all of that. You know, operate the technology of the jet, the rocket. The, you know, the Jaguar engine that powers the, uh, the, the jet, monitor the temperatures in all the systems, you know, the, the castrol hydraulic fluid, the castrol oil and the world's fastest wheel bearings. I've got the, uh, you know, the instrumentation and the design to monitor all of that stuff in real time to keep the car absolutely safe and in top condition every single run. So the cockpit, all of the systems, the whole car has been designed around uh, the, you know, the people who are going to use it. And from the cockpit side, that's me. So it's Although it looks small, cramped, uncomfortable, carbon fibre seat, it's moulded around me. It's the most comfortable seat I will ever sit in. The, uh, the, you know, the harness, the straps, the, uh, the hybrid hands device, the helmet. Working with the FIA guys, we've got the, you know, the safest configuration and the most comfortable because all of that is being built around me to give me the best protection and us the, the, the best possible way of controlling this car safely, step by step, testing it all the way to a thousand miles an hour. You know, the technology of the cockpit is just like the rest of the car, it is world class. Yeah. And uh, are you able to put into words what the experience is like when you're at those kind of speeds driving along? Or is it sort of difficult? Is it, is it any different to, to say, like 200 miles an hour when you're going at supersonic speeds? So. Uh, the sensation is very different when you go extremely fast. Uh, yeah, first of all, small cockpit is going to be very hot in there. It's going to be very, very noisy. Uh, I've got the world's most effective military jet engine just behind me. Um, it chucks out a lot of noise. Now, the good news is when I'm going supersonic, I can't hear the jet engine because I'm now travelling faster than the sound it's making. The bad news is the supersonic shock waves over the top of the cockpit are so powerful on top of this carbon fibre the acoustic box that we've, uh, we've built, that the noise inside the cockpit gets louder the faster we go when the shockwaves fall. So actually putting a, you know, a lot of uh, soundproofing, we're working with our main partners, Jaguar is helping us to actually trim and fit all of this uh, acoustic damping. That's just to make the cockpit viable and tenable for me. It's just to actually stop the noise from destroying my ability to work. Actually stop it from breaking the instruments, it's going to be so loud. Um, There's going to be a lot of G. All of the systems have to work under high G, which is why you know, we're keeping the pressure on Castrol to say, here are the G loadings and, uh, and the, uh, in the loads and the temperatures. Here's why we need the best of all your products to lubricate every piece of the car and make sure none of that ever breaks. Physically, I'm, I'm under the same challenge. Unfortunately, Castrol, the one thing they can't help is uh, in lubrication technologies to help me. 
2G of acceleration is 40 miles an hour per second. You know, if we could wind, if we could chain the car down and wind both engines, the jet and the rocket, up to full speed, cut the chains, the car would do 0 to 60 in one and a half seconds. We're probably the only car here that could do 0 to 60 in just over one second. Uh, slowing down aerodynamically without using parachutes or air brakes, just the aerodynamics, when I close the throttles at 1,000 miles an hour, the car slows, starts slowing down at 3G. That is 60 miles an hour per second. So, something not to try on the way home. If you imagine driving at 60 miles an hour and stopping the car completely in one second, that's going to be a pretty violent experience. Basically, you're going to have to run into something to do that. Um, that would be a normal day in the office for Bloodhound for me, having just been accelerating at the equivalent of 0 to 60 in one and a half seconds. So the violence, the change in sign, the, you know, the 5G uh, split, and because the sign change exacerbates the effect, physiologically it would be very hard work for me, which is why the design of the cockpit is so important. Uh, apart from the noise, the heat, the, uh, the G, and fighting the steering to keep the car straight, because at high speed the, uh, the wheels start skating across the surface, they will penetrate almost not at all, and the faster you go, the less grip you get. That's true of a Formula One car. That's why they need so much download to try and maintain the grip at high speed. We aren't generating download, we're just generating a phenomenal amount of speed. So the grip goes down and down to the point where it's like driving on ice. Fighting all of that in a high G, very noisy, very hot environment is going to be hard work for me. Apart from that, it should be easy. Yeah. Uh, speeds like that, I presume, you cover quite a bit of ground. So um, when you um, do the uh, the record eventually in uh, is it a couple of months' time, is, it, is there a date we set? Well, in terms of dates, we're actually just re-looking at the dates um, and working with all the main partners to work out exactly what we want to achieve in terms of dates. We will be UK testing later on this year. Um, the rocket program is slightly delayed. Uh, that's uh, partly to fit in with NAMO's schedule for the test program partly to fit in with uh, the, uh, the development of the rocket pump, which is slightly delayed. It's now mated up to the Jaguar engine. The, uh, you know, our rocket pump is now going to go across to NAMO when they, uh, when they open up again after the summer break. All, all of that, we've looked at a reschedule. So now's a good time to ask that question. Um, next Friday, um, th there'll be a, uh, a, a, an exclusive announcement on the One Show. And then next weekend, it'll be on the Bloodhound website. So do have a look at the Bloodhound website in the next few days. Um, there's lots of interesting updates on what we're actually going to do, but the bottom line is we are going to be testing the car this year and then rapidly integrating it, ready to uh, to go out to South Africa to test on the world's uh, you know most perfectly prepared and uh, you know hand prepared track. 20 million square meters. 20 million square meters. If you jump on the M3 just near here and drive up to London right, and look at all three lanes, so all three lanes on your side. Yeah, okay, that's that's about 10 meters wide. Drive to London, round the M25, get all the way to Dover through the tunnel, keep going, past Paris. Three lane uh, wide road will take you, 20 million square meters would take you to Moscow. Now if you imagine not driving that, but walking it and sweeping it and digging the stones out by hand over that area, that's what the Northern Cape and South Africa, a team of 300 people, it's taken them five years to prepare the track. We have got the world's best, largest hand prepared area in the history of motorsport to run on. 12 miles long, and the astonishing thing about Bloodhound is from a standing start, it will be the other end of the 12 mile track, stationary again, two minutes later, having covered the middle measured mile in three and a half seconds. Or if you want to look at it another way, if you imagine Wembley Stadium, pitch is 100 metres long, you know, 50 metres uh, of, the, of grass and, uh, and stands at the end, we could drive end to end Wembley Stadium in less time than it takes you to blink your eyes. It takes just over 300 milliseconds to blink your eyes, I'll travel 150 metres in that distance. You could sit in Wembley, if we went through at full speed, you'd blink literally and miss it. The performance is just extraordinary. Well, I wish you great luck with the, uh, for the project and uh, thank you for the, uh, the information. Oh, thank you very much.